Our first speakers here today, uh, Scott Davis is um, a web architect, an accessibility expert, somebody very engaged in responsible tech and data privacy, written several books. Uh, Namisha Astagiri, uh, over 20 years in the industry, an architect, relatively new to ThoughtWorks, but who has experience way back in the day with peer-to-peer -peer decentralized approaches to dealing with trust and data privacy. And they want to uh, explore some emerging technology that has the backing of Sir Tim Berners-Lee himself. Uh, both of them, Namisha in particular, have been very patient with me as they brought me up to, spe uh, up to speed on solid and pods. And I've been impressed both by their enthusiasm and the enthusiasm I've heard from several other uh, very trusted technologists about the same technology. So please welcome Scott and Namisha. Thank you so much, Brandon. We're here to talk to you today about re-decentralizing the web. And recapturing our data. We want to help you understand Tim Berners-Lee's solid and pods. Hi, I'm Nimisha Astagiri, a principal architect with ThoughtWorks. In my past, I've built a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer platform, and I continue to enjoy engineering solutions as responsible technologists. And I'm Scott Davis. I'm a principal engineer and web architect with ThoughtWorks. My job is exploring interesting, cutting edge technologies just like this and putting them to use. So if you saw decentralized in the title of this keynote and got excited, thinking that we would be talking about Bitcoin today, I'm sorry. I don't even know how to break this to you. Bitcoin doesn't even come up after this. We're gonna talk about decentralization on the web and what that means. And frankly, it's got nothing to do with Bitcoin. So years ago, this tweet from Tim Berners-Lee caught my attention. He said, the concept of re-decentralizing the web is now mainstream. Ah, that's a lot to unpack from a simple tweet, don't you think? If I'm reading this correctly, it means that the web started out decentralized. And then at some point it slid into being a little bit more centralized. And so now we're trying to re-decentralize it again or return it to its original, more natural, more distributed state. Now, let's flash back to the mid-1980s when Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web. At that time, he said, Dub 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 had to have one fundamental property it had to be completely decentralized. He designed the web to have no centralized place to register a server. Philosophically, it had to grow in an unlimited way without any bottlenecks, without any centralized control. In other words, he imagined success to not look like a single big monolithic centralized server or website. Instead, he imagined success as a constellation of independent, interlinked websites. A decade later, we hear echoes of that same idea when the semantic web was created. With semantic web, a main idea is linked data. Yes, linked data, as in decentralized data that is linked among different distributed websites. Which brings us to the current project that Tim Berners-Lee is working on, Solid and Pods. Solid is short for social linked data. And Pods is short for personalized online data store. In today's centralized world, websites are siloed with our personal data duplicated and fragmented throughout. With solid, the servers remain decentralized using linked data. And solid, it defines the protocols, the glue that allow the decentralized servers to communicate. And pods, pods, pods are where you store your secure data, like personal photos and social media posts, but also things like your medical records and banking information. So, as we learn more about solid and pods, 
let's focus on the identity story first. Because we're going to discuss this through an idea that's been around for hundreds of years. Kintsugi. You see, Kintsugi is the Japanese art of repairing broken pottery with gold. As a philosophy, it treats breakage and repair as part of the history of the object rather than something to disguise. Feels a bit like web development, don't you think? So, what does Kintsugi have to do with our identities on the web? Well, the first time you asked to create a fake identity for an isolated, siloed website, it seems like a small price to pay for a free service. But the second time, the third time, the tenth time you're creating a new account, the thirtieth, the fiftieth, you find that your identity has been shattered like pottery with the shards scattered across the web. Dealing with how our identity is broken up and scattered to the wind isn't merely an existential question. How many logins do you have? The average person has a hundred or so. And this is because most websites think of themselves as a silo. You visit my website, you create an account, you get access to my services. Now, that might seem reasonable from the website's perspective, but it's awfully simplistic, don't you think? I mean, in real life, you bring your ID to the grocery store. You bring your ID to the gas station, not, not the other way around. And creating one login for every website isn't a one-time cost either. How many times a month are you locked out of some random website account? Well, the average US internet user is locked out at least 10 times a month, if not more. And how many times do you click the forget, forget password button? How many times is your password forgotten or lost or stolen or compromised? Here's the deal. Your password is lost or stolen a lot. A lot. Like, Hundreds of millions of times. Enough that there is a constantly updated Wikipedia page that tracks the size and frequency of these data breaches. Now, you know how painful it is when your password is lost through no fault of your own. Multiply that by hundreds of millions of passwords and then multiply that by each silo on the web, and you've got a pretty good idea of the scope of the problem we're trying to solve here. In fact, over 22 billion data records were breached in 2021 alone. And that's not just leaking photos of your pets and kitties, no. In the US, names and social security numbers were the two most compromised data types. And the healthcare sector they top the list with finance and insurance sectors closely following. As another data point, for two entire weeks earlier this year, many had no access to Atlassian. Atlassian provides development collaboration tools. Our software development teams, they were locked out of their accounts on someone else's silo. Just imagine, imagine the cost of your development stack being down for two entire weeks. If that were not enough, how many times have software developers been locked out of their own source code due to availability issues on GitHub? I mean, GitHub outages, they've lasted sometimes even as long as 24 hours. Speaking of GitHub, this is a tweet from Corey Quinn. And he sums it up in just less than 280 characters. He says, when Git was initially announced as a decentralized way of managing source code, one of the first things done by people with business problems to solve was to centralize it again on GitHub. Surely this is a one-off with no larger lesson to teach us. Surely, right, Scott? <laughs> right. So, 
Like the broken pottery of your identity, Tim Berners-Lee feels that the web is broken as well. And he has a Kintsugi-like solution to fix it. You see, solid is a specification, like HTTP, like TCP IP, that lets people store their data securely on the web in decentralized data stores called pods. Because solid is a standards-based solution, it means that every siloed website in your life could implement it for free, just like the web. Your identity is based on the web ID standard. Access to your pod is controlled through the web access control standard. Standards, free standards, solid standards. Solid and pods standards. Solid and pods. Like Katsugi, they regather the shards of our identity and reunify them. They allow us to reevaluate the way we build our websites today. Can we rebuild them in a way that more closely resembles the web as we imagine it? Using a solution based on, you guessed it, Standards. Now that we've explored identity a bit, let's dig into the data story behind Solid and Pods. And let's start with David Weinberger. In the early days of the web, Weinberger described the web working as small pieces loosely joined. What an elegant way to describe a decentralized architecture to depict a web page as a collage of hyperlinks and decentralized knowledge from across the web, gathered together in a single place, a single web page. So, here is our centralized silo once again, with identity, data, and application logic as one big intertangled ball of mud. What if we decentralize this model by pulling the individual pieces apart. What if our apps were truly small pieces loosely joined? You see, this is solid, visualized. It is small pieces loosely joined. It is a decentralized collection of apps and identities and data stores, personal online data stores, pods. This is your data, this is your decentralized data. Your data. The book Software Architecture, The Hard Parts discusses the importance of data in architecture. As a matter of fact, the authors go so far as to say for many in architecture, data is everything. And they quote someone who by now should be very familiar to you, Tim Berners-Lee is quoted as saying, data is a precious thing and will last longer than the systems themselves. Jamont Degani started a conversation about data mesh in the Hard Parts book. She then expanded this conversation to a full book of her own. Jamont says, data mesh is the nudge that puts us on a new trajectory in how we approach data. This new trajectory moves us away from a centralization of data and ownership towards a, you guessed it, decentralized model. That's the mesh part of data mesh, right? That's right. And Jamak, she describes what a data mesh is, but more importantly, how to transition our thinking, our mental model, towards a more decentralized, distributed approach. Organizationally, we move away from centralized thinking to more decentralized thinking. Architecturally, we move away from monolithic thinking towards distributed thinking. And we move away from the idea that data is a byproduct of our code. Instead, we recognize data and applications as co-equals in importance. Now, 
In the book, Jamak is very careful to discuss her fictional streaming music service as an architectural blueprint rather than a code-based implementation. Sadly, you can't NPM install data mesh today like you can NPM install a solid server. She also makes important distinctions between operational data and analytical data, but let's not get too bogged down in those details right here. At the highest level, this is what a decentralized thinking looks like. And pods, at the end of the day, are simply highly cohesive, loosely coupled trinities of data, identity, and application logic. If the music streaming service chose Solid as their implementation, it would make perfect sense for the company to have a pod for music and a pod for partnerships and so on and so on. You get it, right? So recall that Solid is short for social linked data. Let's, let's take a moment to discuss what linked data is and how our music service might take advantage of it. And solid. Remember, the data is decentralized and meant to be shared or linked. Now, in order to do so, it has to be in a self-documenting format, a global format, or a published schema. And in solid, we do use JSON and XML, but with a slight twist, we add semantics or meaning. On the other hand, in a silo, the data is typically passed around as plain old JSON or XML. The problem is it's typically a custom JSON or XML that only that particular silo understands. And it doesn't work on any other site except that specific site. And you might ask, well, where one might find industry-wide published schemas? Well, Schema.org is a great website for this. You can find well-understood, globally agreed-upon ways to define your linked data. For example, for our music streaming service, we would discover the music recording schema and use that to model the data in a music pod. So here's what the music recording data might look like as JSON LD or JSON linked data. It's the song wrote by the Foo Fighters. Now, it should look like JSON to you, only with added links back to the schema.org data types, like music group and music recording. And since this data is now in a well-understood format, it is trivial to losslessly transform it into other formats, like the XML format RDF. Here's that same song, again, Rope by the Foo Fighters, but this time it's been transformed from JSON LD to RDF. In this format, hopefully it's easy to see why linked data is sometimes affectionately called things, not strings. Every field is a semantic thing that is a well understood global meaning. Data in Plain old JSON simply uses strings for field names. Things not strings is a deceptively simple but incredibly powerful upgrade to the data that you'll be receiving from your pods. Often, when we speak about data and identity, we do so from a company's perspective. However, when Tim talks about solid and pods, it's typically from the user's perspective. After all, what does pod stand for? A personal online data store. But to be clear, not only can individual users create and use their own pods, companies, companies can also create and use their own pods. And you can imagine what this might look like with, let's say, that music streaming service that we saw earlier. Also, you can imagine a company-owned pod just as easily providing analytical data as well as operational data. But let's go back now to imagining through the lens of a user. 
A music app could store your preferences, your likes, and your playlists, store all of that in your pod. And those playlists and likes of yours, because they're stored in your pod as linked data, can now be shared across all of the music apps that you have installed. And as we zoom out, we begin to see whole companies, whole websites around the periphery. This is the same model we saw in Jamak's data mesh book, only with an individual listener at the center of the diagram rather than a streaming music company. But is this feasible in the real world? I mean, are there actual streaming music services using solid and pods today? Well, we learned about solid and pods through the kintsugi of broken identity. We discussed the importance and place for data. Now, let's explore the last piece of the puzzle, solid applications in the real world. In the real world, guess who's experimenting with po pods and solid? The BBC. BBC is a British broadcasting corporation. They want to give individuals control over who they share data with. For example, users can link both Spotify and the BBC in their pods. And when their play histories are pulled into that pod, something magical can happen with the user's permission, of course. If you have a music group that you listen to all the time in Spotify, the BBC can use that data to drive their recommendation engine. All of a sudden, the BBC can begin to suggest news stories and documentaries that feature your favorite music group. Can you see how this benefits everyone? Well, first of all, the BBC's recommendation engine returns much higher quality suggestions, which increases your engagement with the BBC. And when the BBC shows you a news story about your favorite music group, it probably motivates you to go back to Spotify and listen to more of their music. And all of this happens with your permission. Early results? Well, the BBC did user research with those under the age of 35. And people said they'd be happy to use a personal data store and think it's better than what they have today. For them, the key benefits are being able to control data and being able to see who collects, who shares, and uses that data. So here's the view from your pod when you add in Spotify and the BBC. Can you see how we're beginning to replace hypothetical examples here with real world ones? Can you see? Can you see? Hopefully, the ideas are beginning to crystallize. You can begin to see the real limitations of those individual siloed websites with their centralized tangledness of identity, data, and application. The World Wide Web, so much larger than any individual website. And websites, they have to be intentional they, have to be in, they intentionally need to be written to take advantage of that through distributed, decentralized, linked architectures. Isolated, tangled websites can only grow so big. Their growth and expansion is significantly capped by their own marketing efforts and whatever they can build with their own limited in-house development staff. But as we saw with Spotify and the BBC, Websites with an untangled design, they see their value grow each time a new website uses its data in conjunction with theirs. And linked data, it's designed to be shared in the most frictionless way possible from one app to the next. Well, if music applications can share their linked data through solid and pods, what do you think about medical applications? sharing your healthcare linked data through solid and pods. The National Health Service in the UK is experimenting 
with that right now. Imagine that your optometrist spots a serious eye condition and then tells you to film the latest scan with your iPhone? It's, that's how you share it with your doctor because their IT systems are incompatible? You're kidding me, right? The NHS says that solution would be sorted if the optometrist could upload the images to your solid pod. The NHS calls this digital plumbing, piping your optometrist scans directly through to your doctor, with your permission, of course. That's linked data to the rescue. The NHS solid project uses a standard called FIRE. And that stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. The healthcare data in the user's pod is stored using this FIRE standard schema. And in the list of standards, you'll see also RDF listed. RDF, it's a W3C standard for describing web resources and data interchange. And it stands for Resource Description Framework. As a general rule of thumb, when you see RDF, in use, chances are high that you're dealing with things, not strings. As an example, here's a fire record for a patient. Every field is linked back to the fire definition of what a patient is. Every application that can see this data will have a clear, unambiguous view of what each field is for. When we have linked data, things, not strings, then we can begin sharing it between doctors and hospitals and patients and yes, even optometrists. So now you've added the NHS to your pod as well. So the BBC and Spotify don't get access to your medical records, but maybe a new doctor does, or maybe a new insurance company does. And what's really nice about this model is that when you change doctors, your medical records stay with you. You can disable access and permissions for your old doctor and then enable access and permissions for the new one. So at this point, you've seen examples of Spotify and the BBC using pods. And you've seen how your healthcare records could be stored in your pod. But Let's circle back to the original definition of solid that we gave you all the way back at the very beginning of this talk. We told you that solid is short for social linked data. Social, you say, as in social media like Facebook or Twitter, you say? Sure, right. Twitter, Twitter gives you the ability to download your entire history on their service, all your followers and every tweet that you've ever tweeted. And since solid is literally designed for this kind of data, wouldn't it be cool if you could upload all of your tweets to your own pod and serve them up as semantic linked data? Well, I downloaded my Twitter history and here's my very first tweet sent out as I'm landing at the airport back home in Denver on Saturday, May 10th, 2008. What do you think? Is this strings or things? <sighs> yeah, you're right. Sadly, it's strings. It's plain old Jason. Not a lick of semantics as far as the eye can see. And, well, here's my list of followers as well. This really doesn't do me much good outside of the Twitter silo, does it? Because it is plain old Jason. And now for comparison, let's take a look at Tim Berners-Lee's social media profile as reported by his own pod. And by the way, that's actually the real URL to one of his pods, and this is actually the contents of his file. Look at all those linked data schemas at the top of the file. Shoot, Tim has shuffled this link together, linked data together from all over the place, just like a deck of cards. That's composable data at its finest, wouldn't you say? Now, this particular scheme is called FOF, or friend of a friend. That's a standard format that's been around for at least 20 years at this point. So now, can you see that he's sharing his name with you, his birthday, his preferred pronouns? 
But look at that last line. Look at that last line. This is who he knows. This is his social network. This is his social graph. Every item in that graph is a link back to someone else's pod, to someone else's friend of a friend file. And what about for sharing out your tweets? Well, Facebook created a linked data schema called the Open Graph Protocol. And here are the well-defined things, not strings, fields. The Open Graph title, the type, the image, and URL. And notice, and notice how they're using this linked data. This is in the, an example of RDFA or RDF and HTML attributes. RDFA is meant to bake the semantics right into your web page. And just take a moment to imagine how vastly more valuable Squat, Scott's Twitter history would be if they gave it to him as linked data, like friends of friend files and open graph RDF instead of plain old strings. This Twitter user is Jack. Jack Dorsey, you know, the founder of Twitter. Yeah. He says, the days of Usenet, IRC, the web, shoot, even email with PGP are pretty amazing. Centralizing discovery and identity into corporations really damaged the internet. I realize that I'm partially to blame and I regret it. Now, do you feel like we've more fully unpacked the power and meaning of this simple tweet? When Tim Berners-Lee said the concept of re-decentralizing the web is now mainstream. And a way that we can re-decentralize the web is through standards-based solid and pods. We've gone from the imaginary to the reality of what is available today, here and now. Because there is real power in embracing web standards. And in this case, the web standards empower you. Thank you all for your time and attention.